Um, next speaker is uh, Brian Morari School. Um, New York Times bestseller, hundreds of thousands of copies. I have personally listened to the audiobook because it's Brian talking. And uh, who has read it or listened to it? Okay, about 20% of the room, Brian. Uh, we're in France. Wine is important here. Um, it, it was for me too until I stopped drinking a few years ago. Um, and I, I, I smell it now. I still smell it. But uh, like, get ready, fasten your seat belts, because Brian has been uh, looking for the Holy Grail, as he says, for 10 years. He spent a year in the Library of the Vatican, secret you know, things. He will talk to you about that. Uh, and he has very strong statements, like the wine was psychedelic, for example. So in France, it's very special to have Brian, for sure. Brian, thank you so much for coming from New York. The, the stage is yours. Thank you, Brian. Thanks. Brian Morai School. Check, check, check. Cool. OK, cool. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks to Loic and the team for organizing a, a beautiful conference. Nobody says no to a, a good meal in Paris, so uh, good to see everybody. I have some slides. If we bring the lights down just a little bit, um, I'll go through uh, my journey from the past 15 years for those who aren't aware of, of my work and what I've been doing, and then we'll uh, take a, a quick detour into artificial intelligence, and we will end uh, with my proposal for the key to the sustainability of our species. Uh, so. This is how I start the book. Um, this is a phrase in modern Greek that traces back through ancient Greek. It's sort of the, the key in what I refer to as the immortality key. So I'll pronounce it for you in, in Greek. It goes, an pethanis, prin pethanis, dente pethanis, otan pethanis. If you die before you die, you won't die when you die. And this is what has really consumed my life uh, for the past 15 years. I spent, I spent many of those years looking for this single artifact, this, this single chalice, uh, which, which I submit may be one of the most symbolic, one of the most meaningful artifacts that have ever been excavated in the history of Western civilization. And I'll explain why I think that's the case and why I spent 10 years looking for this tiny chalice, which is only about two inches high. Uh, and it was found in, in, in Spain, which, uh, which I'll explain here. So, Yes, I was on the hunt for the Holy Grail. Um, what, what does that mean? Um, I was on the hunt for psychedelic technology, uh, and I was on the hunt to try and prove this gentleman correct. Uh, this, this is Professor Carl Ruck. He was a professor, still is a professor, at Boston University, a tenured professor. And back in 1978, he unleashed a rather controversial hypothesis that the ancient Greeks were using psychedelics to find God, and that just maybe the earliest Christians were also using some of that technology to find God. In the top left, you see Albert Hoffman, the Swiss chemist who famously synthesizes LSD in 1938, discovers its hallucinogenic, mind-altering properties five years later. To his right is Gordon Wasson, and uh, he was the ethnomycologist par excellence. He is credited with the rediscovery of psilocybin-containing mushrooms in the mountains of Oaxaca in 1955, later writes about it in Life magazine, and those two gentlemen are largely responsible for much of what the Western world knows about psychedelics. Um, and together with Carl, 1978, they write this book, The Road to Eleusis, in which they claim that the ancient Greeks uh, were in fact consuming a psychedelic potion at their most, uh, the most well-known sanctuary, the holiest site in ancient Greece. And uh, what they proposed as the magical ingredient was this beautiful purple fungus. It's called ergot. So ergot is this slender blackened stalk that will show up on, on barley and cereal crops and rye. And ergot has been with the human species for as long as agriculture has been with the human species, which is to say at least 12,000 years. It could be a lot longer. But as long as we've been growing wheat, barley, rye to make bread and to brew beer, ergot has been there because it's a very naturally occurring fungus. It shows up on our crops to this day. And if you're not careful, you can brew up a pretty, a pretty nasty batch of beer 
severe if you're not on the lookout for this, this ergot. And these beautiful, beautiful purple mushrooms. So remember that purple. Remember the purple of the mushrooms. Um, so to try and prove this hypothesis correct, um, I went to Greece and I spent many years researching uh, the, the bona fides of, the, of this potion. In 1978, science and technology was at such a place that there was no real hard evidence, no organic data. There was no forensic data to prove that the ancient Greeks had actually consumed something like a psychedelic. There were hints and clues in the literature. You could look to the iconography. You could find hints, but, the, but there was no real scientific data. So I went to Greece. So I flew to Eleusis. This is, this is the, the holiest site, uh, as I mentioned, from the ancient world. It's sort of the Vatican of the ancient world. It, was, uh, it, was, it, it attracted pilgrims for 2,000 years from all around the, the, the Greek-speaking world, which at some point in the classical period, 2,500 years ago, meant people People from what is today Spain, France, um, Italy, as far east as the Near East and parts even further east after Alexander the Great, they all came to this site to experience a vision and to commune with the two goddesses who were responsible for this site, Demeter and Persephone. Demeter, the, the lady of the grain, the goddess of the grain, and her daughter Persephone, who's famously abducted into the underworld, the queen of the dead. Why did they come here? What was the point? The whole reason that people came to Eleusis, and these people include Plato, these people include Sophocles, Cicero, Marcus Aurelius, the best and brightest of Western civilization, all came to Eleusis to experience a vision, some sort of beatific vision, after consuming a potion called the Kikion. Uh, and after consuming this potion, it was said that only those who drank it achieved immortality. Only they would survive beyond death. Only they knew the meaning of life. Uh, and so it was only they, the initiates, um, who could claim any kind of immortality. So I went, to, I went to Greece, talked to the archaeologists, and asked them a simple question. Is there any way that we could test some of these ancient vessels for some actual data to vindicate this rather controversial hypothesis? And the, the, the firm answer was no. There's no testing to be done here. Um, not because they weren't interested, uh, but because all the artifacts that have been excavated from this site had been cleaned, uh, sanitized for conservation purposes. So there was no real, no active data to be gained from the site itself. So uh, we had to get creative and think elsewhere. And so as I just mentioned, the Greek world at the time was expansive. It was all around the Mediterranean and parts further east. So I spent years and years and years trolling through the papers, uh, trolling through the peer-reviewed literature, trying to find some kind of mention of this ergotized potion. And eventually came across some papers in Spanish, which were alluding to uh, a pretty forgotten excavation, uh, the results of which were published in Catalan, the Romance language. And by the way, Catalan is probably one of the least spoken Romance languages, even more less spoken than my ancestors' language of Romanian. Uh, so shout out to the Romanians. So, um, uh, so uh, the, 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 this paper is published in Catalan. It's a giant book of 600 pages. And what they do is they, 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 they describe places like this. So this is, this is not, it looks like Greece, but this is not Greece. This is north, northeastern Spain, north of Barcelona. This is a site called Emporion, which means kind of marketplace. It was a Greek colonial site. It's been there for 2,500 years. Um, and at this site, uh, you see all, the, all these uh, typical Greek gods and deities. And inland from this site, a very special place. Uh, this, this is the place. It's called Pontos. And in Pontos, in the 1990s, at the, at the top there, uh, you can see uh, the site that was being excavated by the archaeologists. And this is a very Greek site. And, and we know that because, well, Greek stuff pop up there. Uh, you, see, you see this uh, pentelic uh, marble here, for example, on which they were sacrificing dogs, which we won't get into. Um, you see uh, the, the greco italic amphorae on site there. You see things like this. That's an incense burner uh, with what the archaeologists think is the, the head of Demeter. You see this vase showing a, a Dionysian revel, the god, Greek god Dionysus, the god of madness and ecstasy and fornication and, um, and uh, psychedelic delight. And here... Uh, is a chalice. That, that's the chalice that I spent all that time looking for. Um, so th this chalice was dug up in this ritual complex, along with all these other very, very Greek-looking artifacts. And they date to around 2,200 years ago, so 200 years before Christ. They dug up these artifacts, and for some reason in the 1990s, they decided to test what was inside 
uh, these chalices, especially that, that, that middle chalice. And that's a very, very Greek chalice. It's called a kantaros. Um, and it's, it's the ritual vessel that was used by the initiates of Dionysus himself. So it, it, it speaks back to these mysteries of Dionysus and these other Greek mysteries that you would find in Eleusis, again, the place that was calling to pilgrims for, for millennia. So when, when they tested this chalice, uh, they found the remnants of beer, which is really interesting. So there was, because th this is not a beer glass, it's, it's more like a shot glass today. It's only a couple inches high. So why would you drink beer from a tiny, tiny chalice? Um, why would you have a shot like that? It's, it's because there, there were other ingredients inside that chalice. What they also discovered were the archaeobotanical remains, the microscopic remains of that very ergot that Karl Ruck had spent his career looking for, but never found. Um, so I took him to this museum uh, where, they, where they conserve the magical chalice, and he had his first look at it. Um, and that was his reaction. That's as excited as he got that day, for some reason. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm dead serious. And even, I talked to him two weeks ago, and it's pretty much, it's been the same expression for two and a half years. Uh, I think, if, you know, he, f he feels vindicated. I think he's, he's pretty happy uh, with the turn of events. He claims that his colleagues view him differently. He claims the, the classics department at Boston University uh, views much of this history differently. Um, but he's, he's taken everything in stride, which is saying a lot because Carl was ostracized from academia for about 40 years. His, his theories were ignored in the 1980s and the 1990s, and for the past, well, about 20 years um, un, until this moment. And so it was, you know, it was, it was kind of funny for me to, to travel with Carl and have this experience, uh, and it's, it, it really speaks to the, the whole notion of timing, uh, which is interesting, we'll get into, the, this notion of time. Um, why did he have to suffer for 40 years? Why did it take us all this time to discover? Um, there he is with Enriqueta Pons, uh, the archaeologist who publishes this find, again, in Catalan, and leaves it in Catalan, which means that, for some reason, the academic community didn't pick up on this discovery, which is more than 20 years old. Um, and I happen to think, if the site were even a few kilometers north into France, that, that maybe if it were published in French, for example, some French scholar would have found out about this, and this had been more widely publicized, but, but, it, but it wasn't. So this is them sitting in the place 2,200 years ago, where it seems initiates, very much like the initiates over in mainland Greece, were consuming some sort of psychedelic potion to commune with the gods. We could say it was something like an LSD beer, an ergotized beer, which is exactly where LSD itself comes from, by the way. This is, this is how we get LSD. It's synthesized from, from that, that, that very ergot. So uh, it's all very, all very suggestive. I asked an artist to help recreate what was happening there. Um, my, my favorite part, is the, the, the dog sacrifice on the right, um, and, and the young girl holding the skull of an ancestor. In addition to the chalice in which they found the microscopic remains of ergot, they also discovered a human jawbone, and in that jawbone were also the remains of ergot. So it really does speak to some sort of intentional consumption of a fungus that is very, very toxic and is normally responsible for things like gangrene and convulsions. It's not, it's not the most entertaining psychedelic, nothing you want to pass around. So these people knew what they were doing. They really, really had some very sophisticated uh, botanical and chemical knowledge to, to brew up a potion like this and to consume it you know, year after year in this sort of ritual complex. So it really raises a profound question about the consumption of a similar potion in Eleusis itself, in mainland Greece. And that, that's what's been, been consuming my time uh, in, in recent months. Okay, what does all that have to do with us um, or anybody? Well, if the ancient Greeks were consuming a psychedelic potion, again, it raises the possibility that at least some communities in early Christianity were doing something similar because early Christianity, around the time of Christ himself, 200 year, uh, 2,000 years ago, and in the centuries thereafter, uh, were largely Greek-speaking communities. Although the, the events in the New Testament take place in the Holy Land, you have to remember that, that Christianity itself takes root in the Greek-speaking parts of the Mediterranean. So Paul, for example, is writing letters in Greek to Greek speakers in places like Corinth. 
you could ride a bicycle from Corinth to Eleusis. So the early churches in Corinth, in Ephesus, in Rome, were very, very familiar with everything I just told you. Well, they, didn't, they maybe didn't know the secret ingredient, but they were very familiar with the notion of mysteries, ancient mysteries, and rituals, and ceremonies that were all geared towards communication with and union with divinity. So this would have been nothing, nothing new for them. And, and Ruck suggested that maybe some of that technology made its way into Christianity. In other words, if there were psychedelic beer being brewed for thousands of years, maybe there was something like a psychedelic wine that was being mixed for hundreds or thousands of years. Does all this technology happen century after century only to come to a dead stop the moment when Christianity begins? Probably not. So if you go into the catacombs under the streets of Rome, you will find the oldest evidence for the world's biggest religion, Christianity. And it's a very different Christianity than we are familiar with today. Some of these frescoes date to the third century into the fourth century. Um, and this one is one of my favorites because it shows you what the early Eucharistic celebration may have looked like when Christians gathered to eat the flesh of Jesus and to drink the blood of Jesus. Something, by the way, that is done on every Sunday, on every continent around the world for billions of believers, two and a half billion Christians to this day. It all stems back to, to these kinds of celebrations, which literally happened underground in places like catacombs and cemeteries, because there were no churches, okay? The, er, in early Christianity, there are no physical buildings, and there's also no Bible. That's not agreed until later. Uh, there's no giant bureaucracy. It's relatively small groups of people huddling together in these Eucharistic, very mysterious ceremonies in which they are consuming the flesh and blood of Jesus. Um, and in the wine that they consume, you can see here written in Latin, so it's, 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 it, it screams from the walls, misce mi irene, and agape misce. That word misce was so common that it, it comes into English through the Latin. Misce means mix, just like it sounds. Mix it up for me. Now, it doesn't say give me or pour me the wine. It says mix me the wine because wine was routinely mixed with all kinds of botanicals, with toxins, with poisons, with aromatic herbs, potentially with fungi, and potentially with hallucinogenic plants. Um, so we don't know what they're mixing here, but we know they're mixing something. And you see it again and again in the catacombs. Irene da calda. Calda. We don't know what calda means, uh, but some scholars venture to guess. has something to do with drugs. It's some sort of potion, a uh, mixture of hot water, wine, and drugs, says this one scholar. Um, and so I went on the hunt for wine. And when you're on the hunt for wine, as Loic mentioned, you come, you come to Paris. Uh, so I was unable to publish... This is one of my favorite photographs, and it never made it in the book, because what you're seeing here is an unexhibited collection from a storeroom inside the Louvre. Um, and I wasn't given permission to publish, but I'm happy to show it to you. Oh, it actually looks great when it's big. Wow. Um, that's, that's Father Francis. That, that's my, my friend, Father Francis, here. Um, I called him up to help me do some deciphering as we went to the museum. Father Francis is an herbalist. Uh, he's a pharmacologist. Uh, he grows his own homeopathic medicine. Um, he's exactly the age as my, as my father, um, and he's also a Catholic priest. And so I called up Father Francis, and I asked him to come with me to check out a footnote. In that 1978 book that I mentioned by Hoffman um, and, and Ruck and Wasson, they, there's a tiny footnote where Ruck says that, you know, we have some, some clues to what was happening with this ancient Greek wine. And, and he mentions a book from 1912 by a German scholar um, named uh, Frickenhaus. And Frickenhaus in this book talks about wine being mixed up with all these different ingredients. And Frickenhaus, more than 100 years ago, cites these two very specific vessels, these two very specific chalices, these wine containers, which you see there. Um, and he mentions that they're stored at the Louvre, but that nobody can find them. So I wrote a random email to the curator of the Greek ceramics at the Louvre, 
And I said, hey, you know, I'm reading this, this crazy book with this crazy footnote. There's these two vessels which have gone missing. Does the Louvre still have them? Because this was 1912. And the answer came back that yes, they actually have them. And so maybe we could take a closer look and find out what they were putting into this wine. So very clearly, and these date from the 5th century BC, 2,500 years ago, you see priestesses adding things to wine. They're not just, they, they're always mixing things to wine and tossing them in. And Frickenhaus was very clear that on this vessel, he claims that he saw saw the magic ingredient. And so finally, we have an opportunity to see the magic ingredient that went into this, uh, this concoction, this, this divine wine. And so as Father and Francis and I traveled from the US and Italy respectively to go backstage at the Louvre to finally see what, uh, what was hiding in the wine, uh, this is what we found, that it went missing. <laughs> the vessel, the goddamn vessel was chipped. Um, and no one knows who mishandled it, or why, but sometime between 1912 and when we saw this in 2018, 2019, the secret ingredient that the priestess is holding in her right hand went missing. So another, another dead end. What do, you, what do you do after that when you're at the Louvre and you have the rest of the day and nothing to find? Um, you go to the largest painting in the largest museum in the world. This is the largest painting inside the Louvre. It's the wedding feast at Cana. This is not supposed to be subtle. This is directly across from the Mona Lisa. Whenever you walk into this room, the entire room is staring at the Mona Lisa and taking selfies while I was the only person looking at the largest painting in the largest museum in the world, the wedding feast at Cana. And the reason it came to my mind is because there's more magic happening in that museum, and there's more wine mixing. For those who aren't familiar with this scene, it's one of the most famous scenes from the Gospel, but ironically, it only occurs in the Gospel of John, in John's second chapter. It's the famous scene uh, where Jesus is invited by his mom, Mary, to a wedding. All the wine runs out, when everybody is already shit-faced, by the way, and it says that in the Greek of John's Gospel, that's a rough translation, um, and Mary says, Jesus, for the past 30 years, you know, people have been very suspicious because you came out of nowhere. You were the son of God. Joseph isn't your father. No one knows who your father is, but you came along and were born claiming to be the son of God and haven't done one goddamn miracle for the past 30 years. Could you please do something to prove to people that you are in fact the son of God? And so Jesus, in the middle of the party, uh, transforms, and we have this number, 180 gallons of water into wine. Jesus serves 180 gallons of wine to people who are already drunk. <laughs> and that's literally the first miracle in John's gospel. So don't tell me that Christians don't know how to party. You can see all the wine being mixed up here. And nobody can believe it, by the way. No one's ever seen this for some reason, at least in, in John's description of this miracle event and the way the, the staff is dumbstruck at the fact that all this wine has been produced. But John wasn't speaking to us. Now remember what we've been talking about the past 20 minutes. In the ancient world, it was understood that beer was mixed with different things. It was understood that wine was mixed with different things and that wine was rather sacred and mysterious and potentially visionary. Any Greek speaker in the first century, second century AD, who hears this story automatically thinks of the obvious place where these water to wine miracles begin, and that's in ancient Greece. Everybody would have remembered the Bacchanal of the Andrians. This is a painting by Titian, and it's talking about the miracle on the Greek island of Andros that occurred on every epiphany, January 5th, January 6th, every year, in the sanctuary of Dionysus, that Greek god of wine and madness and ecstasy, every single year on cue, inside the sanctuary, a magical spring of water would transform inexplicably into wine. And that, that water into wine would flow for an entire week, every single year. And the writer Pausanias talks about this, and having seen this in person, and talked to eyewitnesses. And so this is, this is Titian's rendition of that event. So what the hell's going on here? Um, because in addition to the island of Andros, there were 
a number of stories about the magical wine of Dionysus that would be turned from water or back into wine and, and flowed for, for centuries. And so we have to begin asking, what is John trying to c communicate here? What is it about the Greek god Dionysus on the left, wearing his crown, his crown of ivy, and drenched in purple, always in purple, remember that purple. And on the right you see Jesus, also with his crown, same exact word used in Greek in the Gospels, the Stephanos, his crown of thorns, drenched in purple, always in purple, who gives us the life-giving sacrament of his flesh and blood, just like Dionysus, centuries before the Gospels. The blood of Dionysus is referred to um, as the wine. Wine and blood are equated for centuries and centuries and centuries before Jesus comes on the scene. And it was seen as a magic potion that united you with, with divinity. And this is how they did it. This was the religion of the Dionysians. These were the Mynads, the women who brewed the wine, who mixed the wine, and who went into the forest half naked, um, chasing down goats, and then slaying the goats, and eating the raw flesh and drinking their blood. Okay? That's what was happening in, in, in ancient Greece. And so there are interesting parallels to early Christianity. Don't read all that text. I only put it there to show you I don't make this shit up. Uh, this is a very well-known scholar named Dennis McDonald uh, who has a book called The Dionysian Gospel because he's referring to how the Greek of John's Gospel is eerily reminiscent of the Greek of the Euripides, uh, Euripides Bacchae from 400 years before Jesus, 500 years before John's Gospel. 500 years before John's Gospel, Euripides is using the same kind of Greek that John himself would use. And again, this, this Greek is laden with all these notions of eating flesh and consuming blood in this omaphagos. Omaphagos is this Greek word for consuming flesh and blood, and blood straight from the sacrificial victims. And it shows up in John's gospel because I think John is trying to communicate to his audience that the mysteries of Dionysus, these maddening mysteries, had survived in some iteration in these early Christian churches. And so we have literature that points to all this crazy wine, and we have the textual evidence, and we have some iconography that I went searching for in the Louvre, as you saw, but we actually have organic data, and we actually have forensic data. Now, if, if you, even five years ago, if you'd gone to every university in Europe and asked them, is there any evidence for psychedelic wine in the ancient world? The strong answer that came back to me for years and years was absolutely not, and that's absurd. It's the same, the same answer that came back to Karl Ruck for 40 years. Um, and for some reason, there was this paper, which was written in, in English, of all things, um, from 20 years ago. There was a discovery at Pompeii. There were some, some, some wine vessels, some big dolia, which could hold gallons of wine. And inside these dolia, just like that tiny chalice from Spain, they found some rather interesting ingredients, and they wrote about it. And for some reason, this went ignored for 20 years. But inside this wine, they found opium, and they found cannabis, and they found henbane, and they found black nightshade. And in addition to those rather trippy nightshade plants and cannabis and opium, they also found the skeletal remains of frogs and lizards and toads. So nothing you'd want to serve to your dinner guests, but a pretty kick-ass wine um, that points to something like witchcraft of, of, of Shakespeare. So I took the, those, those two data points and that's really all we had. Uh, the discovery from Greece, uh, well, the, the Grecian temple in Spain, and the discovery from Pompeii. And uh, I announced this to, to the world in September, um, September 2020. And my wife, who's here with us, and, and our daughters went down to Uruguay as pandemic refugees. I went to Texas to talk about this. And a week later, I was in quarantine in a beautiful hotel in Montevideo uh, talking to CNN about the fact that the ancient Greeks uh, were tripping on drugs. Um, and that was, that, that was Saturday viewing in America. Um, so, what the hell has happened since then? Well, um, th this went from being a, a, a pretty obscure and esoteric field of study, archaeobotany, archaeochemistry, uh, to something that is, that is catching headlines around the world, and it's really, really hard to explain. Um, there's a number of discoveries I can talk about from the past couple years. This one is by far the most interesting um, because in response to that question about was there really psychedelic beer, was there really psychedelic wine, there's also a question about you know, how far back does this go? Basically, is there really a psychedelic tradition within Europe? 
uh, because nowadays we think about uh, the psychedelic plants and fungi from the Americas, for example, or from different African traditions or the Asia Pacific. And there's always been this bias, this really strong academic bias over the fact that, that indigenous Europeans also had some sort of similar technology. And we didn't really have any, any strong leads aside from this, uh, these, these two discoveries that I mentioned um, until literally a few weeks ago. Headlines in the New York Times, Nat Geo, BBC, all around the world, uh, tripping in the Bronze Age. European shamans took psychedelic drugs 3,000 years ago. An extraordinary discovery, also from Spain, the island of Menorca, uh, not, not far from here, as a matter of fact. Inside a cave on Menorca, dated to about 2,800 years ago, the Bronze Age, and potentially longer, they found a really interesting um, assemblage of artifacts. What they found were hair samples. They found samples of hair that clearly meant a lot to the people who sequestered them in this, in this cave. They found about 200 bodies that had been laid there over the years, and even further back, secreted in, in, in the hidden innermost chamber of this sacred cave, they found these wooden tubes, and inside these wooden tubes, they found hair samples. And when they tested the, the hair samples under gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, they found that they contained the, the alkaloids atropine and scopolamine. And anybody who knows about those tropane alkaloids knows that they also occur in the henbane and the black nightshade that I mentioned in that trippy Pompeian wine. So clearly, we now have undeniable archaeochemical evidence that the indigenous Europeans were using hallucinogenic, visionary, mind-altering, very crazy drugs to enter into some kind of ritual state. They preserved this hair for a reason because it meant something to them and it communicated something about the rituals that folks would endure, shamanic rituals in Europe to, to access divinity, to communicate with the gods, to speak with ancestors, to divine the future, to heal those who were injured, and ultimately to find perhaps some sense of immortality. And so whatever was happening here, we don't know what was happening uh, in Menorca, but what, whatever was happening may have gone on to influence what we later find in that mystery tradition, right? Um, in Spain, or what was happening in Greece or Italy. And so we're, we're just beginning to piece together all these different clues about this really, really bona fide psychedelic tradition that is now popping up in Europe. So what does that mean when you compare all this history with what's happening today? What does that mean for the future of psychedelic studies? What does it mean for the future of consciousness studies? This is my friend Roland Griffiths, um, who some of you may know has been responsible uh, for some of the most groundbreaking studies on psilocybin at Johns Hopkins University, just about an, an hour from our home in Washington, DC. Over the past 20 years, he's turned out dozens and dozens and dozens of peer-reviewed papers on the dramatic effects of psilocybin, largely for therapeutic purposes, things like anxiety, depression, uh, trauma, substance abuse, the list goes on. And despite the past 20 years of focusing on that, um, Roland, who's now dying of cancer, has stage four cancer, unfortunately, um, what he talks about as his legacy is the fact that the study of psilocybin could very well be critical to the, the survival of the human species. And that's a, that's a very big statement. And when, when I first read this in the New York Times, again, only a few weeks ago, um, it, it caused me to pause because, and I'm not sure if Roland knows this, or maybe he knew it sub subconsciously, but this notion of psychedelics somehow being central, sorry, that wasn't, that wasn't me. Uh, this, this, this notion of psychedelics being central to our survival um, is exactly, word for word, how it was described in antiquity. This is a book I mentioned in mine. This is called Karenyi. There's no, no greater gold standard scholar of the classics will you find than Hungarian-born Karl Karenyi. He writes this book in 1962, um, Eloisis, the von Eloisis. It's originally in German. Um, and what he says about Eleusis is really, really profound. He, he cites the fact that an, an initiate to Eleusis, that, that, that holiest of sites in Greece, uh, a Roman named Praetextatus, as these mysteries are about to be erased from the books of history by the newly Christianized Roman Empire. Again, they survived for, for thousands of years until the fourth century when the Roman emperors, who are now becoming Christian, decide it's time to get rid of these pagan rites. It's time to get rid of these mysterious, shadowy, perhaps psychedelic, certainly visionary, underground occult rites. 
and it's time for Christianity to spread its bureaucracy far and wide. It's time for Christianity to come out of those catacombs, to come above ground, and to, to squash and, and eliminate these mysteries once and for all. And what this initiate, Praetextatu, says as the emperor in 364 AD is about to abolish everything we've been discussing, rites that go back to the Bronze Age, what Praetextatu says, and this is recorded in Greek, is that if you eliminate the mysteries of Eleusis, you will make life on planet Earth unlivable. You will make life unlivable. He uses the abiotos, abiotos. And that doesn't mean Greek existence, it means human existence. And Karenyi, the scholar, says that there is no formulation like that in the history of Greek literature. That it's only here that we hear about the notion of life itself being bound up with the vision at Eleusis. So, when this is being recorded 1,600 years ago, and when Roland Griffiths himself is talking about psychedelics somehow being bound up to the survival of our species, I think we should, I think we should notice that and take pause, because there's another narrative, which we'll go through in the last 10 minutes here. There's another narrative about the plight of our species, and it's a very different narrative um, about the end of human civilization. And I highly recommend this interview with uh, Yudkowsky, um, who doesn't look too happy there, although um, he waxes on for two hours about the potential of artificial intelligence to wipe the human species off the earth. And, and he's not the only one. And you've heard uh, some of these sound bites and you've read some of the reviews in recent, recent months and weeks. This was a letter that came from the Future of Life Institute, co-founded by Max Tegmark, amongst others. An open letter that was co-signed uh, co by, by Elon Musk and Wozniak and many others, um, begging for at least a six-month pause on AI experimentation and asking very profound questions like, should we develop non-human minds that might eventually outnumber, outsmart, obsolete, and replace us? Should we risk loss of control of our civilization? Everyone is talking about human civilization for some reason. And they recommend a number of potential regulatory reforms, laudable though they are, which probably won't work. Um, among them, well-resourced institutions for coping with the dramatic economic and political disruptions, especially to democracy, that AI will cause. Not that it might cause someday, that AI will cause. What is AI going to unleash on us? Well, I'll go through this very quickly because I think that you all intuit what's happening here. This is an interview with, with Bengio a few weeks ago in the Times. Uh, what's the problem here? Well, disinformation is the most obvious one, uh, which we've been subject to over social media already. Uh, people seeking emotional support, raw information that turn out to be wrong. Medium risk is job loss, disruptions in the, in the labor market. Bloomberg says it could be nearly a quarter of all workers. I've seen estimates of a billion redundancies in the decade ahead. Um, what's, the, what's the big loss? The, the, the nightmare scenario is loss of control completely. Even if we go straight forward, says Aguirre, another co-founder of the Future of Life Institute, he says three years from now, things are pretty weird. Things are pretty weird. And then he goes on to say, if there's no governance, well, um, things get really, really crazy. My favorite is Jeffrey Hinton, uh, who also went on CNN and says the apocalypse is at hand, basically. Um, Jeffrey was at Google. Uh, he left recently after decades of research um, in neural networks, mainly, in AI, saying that uh, this, this is about to get out of control. Um, and that uh, basically, the threat that we're facing right now is more urgent than climate change itself. Um, how could that be the case? Well, the narrative goes back at least 10 years. Um, Elon was talking about this in 2014. He said that AI, this is almost 10 years ago, was humanity's biggest existential threat. Stephen Hawking said something similar. I think this was largely after Nick Bostrom's book, which I highly recommend, Superintelligence, first came out. Um, the concerns were real. 10 years ago, what does it say that the same people are saying the same things now 10 years on? I think that we crossed the threshold after ChatGPT came out and people are beginning to realize uh, that there is powerful technology here that maybe we haven't properly aligned ourselves with. 20 years ago, Morpheus himself uh, told us how we started battling the machines in the first place. We marveled at our own magnificence as we gave birth to AI. And so now it's basically choose your own apocalypse. Is it gonna be HAL 9000? Is it Ultron? Is it poor Will Smith trying to keep us safe? Is it Wally? -E? Um, are the robots coming to get us? 
It's a very real possibility that we can't ignore. But my favorite commentator on AI is Jared Lanier. And he had this to say in, uh, in the New Yorker a couple weeks ago, there is no AI. And why do we mythologize it as such, as this other entity that we can't control? Now, I implicitly trust anybody with dreadlocks like this. And so I pay attention to everything that Jared has to say. And he says, basically, from my perspective, there's no looming robot apocalypse, but that basically what, what the worst that could happen here is that um, we're not communicating with, the, with, with each other, and that basically we die through insanity, um, and we, we lose sight of our, of our common humanity and what really binds us. And in his book, um, You Are Not a Gadget, which I also highly recommend, he says, the whole point of this technology was to make the world more creative and expressive and empathic and interesting, and that's not really happening. And again, it's not just chat GPT and what's about to come. We've already seen this in social media over the past decade. We've already seen how these, ag these algorithms infect our life, and instead of giving us more choices, actually give us less choice in this, uh, this attention economy and how it robs us of the things that made us human in the first place, which is our curiosity and our ability to communicate. And he says that, you know, basically social media and now AI is making us lazy and incurious. We used to sift through stacks in a record shop or browse in bookshops, and all we do now is just thumb through the same feed that's been pumped into our subconscious year after year, and it's, and it's eliminating possibility, and it's, it's, it's funneling data instead of opening data to us. Um, and then I got to this headline, which has stopped me in my tracks. We've discovered the secret of immortality. The bad news is it's not for us. And this is where in the, in the last five minutes here, I will take great issue with, uh, with, with Jeffrey, uh, who no doubt is a brilliant man, um, but no doubt does not understand immortality, because it's something I've dedicated the past 15 years of my life to. But, but, but I, 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 I see the intuition, right? If you read that, there are more image variations on mid-journey than there are atoms in the observable universe. That should also make you pause about what we're facing here and the massive intelligence at stake here. Um, Jeffrey says that when one of them learns something, he's referring to uh, the networks, all of them know it, and you can easily store more copies. So the good news is we've discovered the secret of immortality. The bad news, it's not for us. I don't think that's where our salvation lies. And I agree with Jared that we shouldn't mythologize this looming AI. Um, what we should do is tap into the immortality that kept our species alive for thousands of years. I'm going back to that Greek phrase that largely middle-aged men are now tattooing onto their forearms and sending to my inbox <laughs> every couple weeks. This is how we defeat the robots. This is how we do it. This is, this is my clarion call to taking down AI. I'm Pethanis, Prim Pethanis, Tenta Pethanis, Otan Pethanis. Um, that notion of something special about humanity goes back to the Renaissance. This is Pico della Mirandola. He writes the oration on the dignity, the dignity of man. It's written in Latin, de hominis dignitate. What is, what, is, what is dignified about the human species? What makes us special, if anything? When he's looking for answers, Pico talks about the epoptea. That's the Greek for the vision that was experienced at Eleusis, the vision that was experienced after consuming that tiny chalice of ergotized beer in Spain, that vision that was perhaps seen by the Bronze Age inhabitants of the Spanish island of Menorca. It's all about visions and about achieving that kind of vision while still immortal. It's that gift of immortality. That's true immortality. To achieve that kind of vision, perhaps through psychedelic technology and other archaic techniques of ecstasy. This was the manifest of the Renaissance. All the arts and humanities that we know today, the university as we know it, all stems from this, this oration. And he talks about the moments of philosophy, thanks to Bacchus, the same Dionysus whose rites that we saw um, from the Louvre to the ancient texts to that Pompeian wine. And he talks about dying to self. The self has to die to self. You have to die before you die, before you are initiated as a proper philosopher. And he talks about everything from the seers of Phoebus to the winged lovers of theology and the seraphim. And Terence McKenna, by the way, perhaps one of the greatest psychedelic evangelists of the past generation, was very quick to quote Pico. And he was very quick to say that, if you read this properly, it's not that, it's not that homo sapiens could be as good as the angels. We are better 
than even the angels. We are better than, than the supreme creation. And that filled with the Godhead, we shall be no longer ourselves, but the very one who made us. In other words, we are divine. That's what makes us special. I'm not sure that AI is divine. If it does discover that, we are shit out of luck. But in the meantime, I do think that there's something important about us, and here's the key. As long as we're using science fiction to damn us, let's use science fiction to save us, right? Does anybody know what Temet Noske means? Fuck yeah. <laughs> know thyself. When Neo is asking the oracle, by the way, this is Seraph, no coincidence, and that's a winged lover of theology in the middle, Dr. Cornell West, um, who plays himself for some reason. I never figured out why. He's, he doesn't even change his name. He's Counselor West in the Matrix. Um, and when Neo is asking, what's the point of all this? How does the seer know what she sees? What is his destiny? How does he do all this? The answer is very clear. On the lintel above her door, just like at the Temple of Apollo in Delphi, the answer comes back to Neo, know thyself. Um, it should be temet ipsum, temet ipsum noske, which comes from the Greek, gnothiseaton. That was inscribed at the Temple of Apollo at Delphi. Know thyself, gnothiseaton. What does that mean? Temet noske, gnothiseaton. It means that we need to open our eyes and see with different eyes. In Matrix Revolutions, Neo is blinded. Why is he blinded? Because the initiates, the bards, the prophets, the seers were always blind to this reality. This is the Eucrates votive relief, which was discovered at Eleusis 2,500 years ago. This was left by a blind person who, after drinking the kukion and having the vision, had his eyesight restored. He saw for the first time, and he left this plaque to tell us 2,500 years later, if you go to Eleusis, you will not only live forever, you will see the real reality. Reality. You will see true reality, which is why Neo in purple, like my purple handband here that was given to me today, in purple, if Neo sees with his real eyes, he sees true reality, just like the purple clad divinities of antiquity. You see it in the Bacchae, you see it in the New Testament. I won't, I won't waste that Greek on you just now. Um, I'll take you to Cornell West. We don't have much time for this, but a couple years ago, uh, the classics department at Howard University, one of my country's oldest historically black colleges and universities, decided to get rid of its classics department, get rid of Latin and Greek. Cornell West, Counselor West from the Matrix, um, called it a spiritual catastrophe. And he said that it's, it's an indication of spiritual decay in American culture. What kind of creatures are we? This is what we should be asking. This is what the classics help us to find. What kind of creatures are we? This is why we study Latin and Greek. It's why Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. himself quotes Socrates three times in his letter from Birmingham jail in 1963. This is not footnote stuff. This is not the kind of stuff we can, we can afford to ignore. This is our tradition. This is the tradition of Western civilization, which if it goes lost like this, or if it goes lost like this, or if it goes lost, or if it goes lost and we forget where Christianity came from and we forget about the mysteries and we no longer pursue this, then we will forget this. This is my answer to how we defeat the robots. And I, I won't, I didn't put the English in there because I want you to just focus on the Greek for the last 10 seconds that I have here. Um, read Plotinus. If you read Plotinus, everything will be okay. Because Plotinus says, stop looking, me blepen, stop looking. You need to exchange these eyes for a new vision, a new type of vision which everyone has, in eje men pas, chrontai de oligoi. Everyone has, but few people ever use. We all have the ability to see reality as it properly is. If we open our eyes, we can see the light. It's unbelievable, Trin. Light is everywhere. Although he's blind, he sees light is everywhere. And by identifying with that source code inside himself, that's how you, how you defeat the bots. That's how you transform nature. And that's how you alchemically bring back the technology that will take us to the cosmos without and the cosmos within. Thank you. Ryan Morris School. And now, Brian has a little surprise for you. Yeah. If you look under your seat, there is a little gift. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good.
pretty good. <laughs> Drinks for everybody. <laughs> yeah, a glass of wine. We're in Paris. That's good. That's good. <laughs> you came from New York. I, I would listen to you for, for the entire day. Please come to me. Maybe I do the next power in New York. Yeah, yeah. come to the States, everybody. Come to the States. <laughs> we'll have fun. Um, what would you, I mean, you've said a lot, but what, what would be your, your advice to navigate this, like open your eyes, like your last advice? What, right. what would you, how concretely, because we have Zach Bell tomorrow talking about, you know how many forms of, is he here? Spirituality, right here. Right here. Uh, the religion of no religion, which we talk about too. Right. There are so many different forms of spirituality nowadays. How, how do we navigate this? Uh, yeah, Zach and I were talking about this this last night, the fastest growing religion that, that, that there is, this religion of no religion. The, the subtitle of my book is The Religion With No Name. I think we're talking about largely the same thing. We live in unprecedented times where we have access to the entirety of the world's wisdom traditions and spirituality. And so we want to be the, the inheritors of all this, but the slaves to none, the spiritual but not religious. I mean, I would suggest that we not make it up from scratch, um, and I suggest that we dive into traditions, that we ground ourselves in traditions, traditions that feel authentic to us, traditions that are thousands of years old, um, traditions that have wound their way, in my case, uh, through Western civilization as a Irish, Romanian, wannabe Greek speaker who was raised Catholic. But you said we're all indigenous, right? We're all indigenous. This is the, the most important point I try to make is that this is universal. Um, when I look at plant technology, psychedelics, they don't belong to any one person. They are prehistoric. They, they predate the human species. There's evidence that they were being used before Homo sapiens came around. And so this is something that is truly universal. I think it's supreme technology and something that if we learn how to harness properly, authentically and sacredly, it can save us. So we know your book. Um, how can we help? We have 40 countries here, more online. What, what can we do together? Like how, how can we help you for your next 10 years? Uh, or walk with you? We can get off our screens. That's, that's a, although I'm on my screen all day. Um, I'm also a fraud because I haven't done psychedelics, as most people know. Um, so, but I, I, would, I would suggest that <laughs> we, we need, <laughs> we need more, we, I think we need research into what makes this authentic. That's what I would ask. Okay. Um, and I would ask people to, to reach out to me. Um, there, there's a lot happening at, at various universities in the States and around the world, looking into how, how do we harness the te this technology. You speak at Harvard yeah. and Stanford. And, and Yale, there's a program at Yale and Johns Hopkins. So, so about this, about psychedelics. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, so th th that's, that's some conversations we can be having. Th that was a non-conversation conversation two years ago. So it's now a conversation in some of the leading universities um, in, in, in my country and with governments around the world, religious institutions. This is a conversation we all need to be having. Brian, thank you so much for coming for us. Cool. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks,